That's right. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing retired astronaut Captain Mike Baker. In this interview, I asked him a bunch of really interesting questions that went from things like what space travel is like, what being out in space is like, and even little lessons talking about how to get into space. I bet you guys are all super interested and just itching in your seats to hear about it. So let's jump right into our first question. All right, so first off, what is an astronaut and what does the job mean? Just for those that aren't super sure. An astronaut, I guess, is someone that flies in space. <laughs> Okay. And the job, uh, yeah, that's that's actually a very good question because you know I I was an astronaut for 32 years I guess and I spent 40 days in space. Wow. Okay. So you have to like the other things that you do mm -hmm. <laughs> because you don't spend a lot of that time. I mean, I flew four missions and so in each mission it was about a year's worth of training. So that was four years and. Uh, when we first started, you're, you're, they call you an astronaut candidate, and they, you spend a year, basically, for us, we were learning, you spend the whole time uh, learning to fly the T-38, learning how to fly this shuttle, doing all the shuttle training. Uh, and we took also a bunch of different, we had a bunch of different courses, or like seminars, which was actually kind of fun. Um, we had, we did, we learned about geology and oceanography, um, high-speed aerodynamics, public speaking. I mean, we had all sorts of different Everything. courses on different things, which was actually, like I said, a lot of fun. And then at the end of the year, we they told us that we were eligible for um, assignment mm. to a mission. And so they dropped the candidate and we just became, started calling us astronauts, even though I hadn't flown before. <laughs> all right. And um, yeah, so then we had, we had several different types of jobs in the office, mm -hmm. all basically in support of missions. So we had, the first job I think I had was at SAIL, which is stands for Shuttle Avionics Integration Laboratories, which was kind of an interesting place um, where they had the, all the same avionics on the shuttle mm -hmm. with the exact same cable lengths and all that laid out in a room. Mm -hmm. And that's where they did all the testing on the software. And so we were assigned there to do the testing. As, as the astronaut, you know, flipping switches and stuff in the cockpit. And that was great because you could learn, you could support the program and also learn about the shuttle at the same time. And then uh, I, I was assigned as the CAPCOM. Are you familiar with CAPCOM? is the guy who talks to the crew members from mm -hmm. Mission Control. Yeah. And so I did a launch and entry um, CAPCOM, which was great. I really learned a lot there because you're sitting in the mission control center with all the flight controllers and, you, and you're going through all the procedures. Uh, and so I did that for, I don't even know how, I did it a lot, 12 missions, I think, a long time. Uh, and then right before I got assigned to my first mission, I got, I, we had this other group of people we called uh, Cape Crusaders. Okay. So they would go support actually anything that had to do with uh, human interface testing at Kennedy Space Center mm -hmm. uh, on the space shuttle, we would do. And we also were responsible for strapping in the crews and taking care of all the switches like about two or three days before launch. Okay. And then when the crew would come out to go to launch, we would strap them in. Hey, editing the science kid here. Before we go into the next segment, I wanted to give you guys some further background on Captain Mike Baker. This is his astronaut profile, but it would take way too long for me to read the whole thing, so here's a quick summary. Captain Mike Baker was born in Memphis, Tennessee, but he spent a lot of his life in Lemoore, California, so he calls that his hometown. He got his Bachelor's of Science in Aerospace Engineering and went to the Navy right after that. He wanted to fly in the Navy, so he attended test pilot school and got his wings of gold. This led him to have logged over 5,400 hours of flying time in 50 different types of airplanes. He was then later selected by NASA for his many accomplishments and worked there for around 30 years. And during that time, he was in Capcom for 11 shuttle missions, assistant director for, of NASA's Johnson Space Center for human spaceflight programs, and as the International Space Station program manager for international and crew operations. Sometime during his time working at NASA, he was selected to hop on a rocket ship, and it was in space for just around 965 hours. 
or just around 40 days. Recently, he was also the president and CEO of a U.S. and Russia joint venture until 2019. How did it feel to be launched into space? And can you walk me through what it takes to get a rocket launched in outer space? Yeah, um, I talk about that a lot in my presentations, but it's uh, it's an exciting thing. You know, it takes a lot of energy to get going, but you know, for the space shuttle anyway, what we would do is we would launch, uh, we would ignite the three main engines, which were liquid propellant engines fed with propellant from the external tank. Mm -hmm. And we'd ignite them about six seconds before launch and they'd come up to 100% of their thrust, and then we would light the solid rocket boosters, on one on each side. And when we did that, you know, you jump off the launch pad at about two and a half times the acceleration of gravity, or 2.5 Gs, which is a bit of big, big kick. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people don't understand the, uh, you know, when you talk about Gs, yeah. but it, I always like to say if, okay, if you, it, maybe it's easier if you think about an aircraft being catapulted off an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. That's about 2.5 Gs of acceleration. Okay. And it only lasts for about three or four seconds. So that, you know, when, the, when we're on the solid rocket boosters, so we're at two and a half Gs of acceleration for the first two minutes of the flight. And the solid rocket motors burn really rough, so there's a lot of vibration and a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. So there's, and some people even call it kind of violent, but it's a big acceleration for the first two minutes and then when the solid rocket motors are finished we we drop them off in the, um, the ocean they fell you know parachutes and picked up by boats and used in later flights mm -hmm. but then the acceleration drops way down from 2.5 g's to like 0.8 g's okay it almost feels like you stopped <laughs> yeah and then as they use propellant up in the external tank you accelerate out to three g's which occurs about seven and a half minutes into the flight and also it gets really smooth because the main engines just run a lot smoother than the solid rocket motors. Yeah. And so at seven and a half minutes, we had to throttle the main engines back to maintain three Gs because that's the structural limitation of the, of the shuttle. Mm -hmm. And then at eight and a half minutes, the propellant's pretty much all gone. You're going 17,500 miles an hour, which is always amazing. Yeah. When I, it's unbelievable actually. Yeah. So we shut the main engines down and you go from three Gs to zero G and you're in space. That's five miles a second, by the way, which is uh, unbelievable. Fast. So the, it's very quick and in eight and a half minutes, you get into space. Yeah. Does it have to go that fast to get into outer space? It Could does. you just like slowly ascend? No, that's a good question. A lot of people have misconceptions, you know, we call it, they actually call it microgravity. You probably heard that term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's because I can give you this quick little lesson. So we, you know, we, we always, you asked for this. It's a short lesson of orbital mechanics. Okay. So if you, and I always think it's important to know where you are, like right here at Kennedy or Johnson Space Center, we're at about, I believe, 29 degrees north latitude, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. If you're at Kennedy Space Center, it's at 28 and a half degrees north latitude. And when you launch your rockets, you like to go due east to get the most assistance from the Earth's rotation. Um, but when you do that, if this is the Earth and you launch from Kennedy Space Center due east, you end up in an orbit that's inclined to the equator 28 and a half degrees. So on this side of the orbit, you're at 28 and a half degrees north latitude. On this side of the orbit, you're 28 and a half degrees south latitude. And you're going around the Earth like this. And you don't cover much of the Earth there. That's I've got into kind of a, a different question. But so in order to get into to the orbit, you have to go 17,500 miles an hour. Otherwise, you continue to hit the Earth. It's like, so when you think about if you throw a ball, it goes like this and curves, hits yeah. the ground, right? You throw it faster, it goes further, but eventually keeps curving and hits the ground. But if you throw it 17,500 miles an hour, it It'll keeps falling through. around the Earth. Mm. Interesting. So you're falling around the Earth, and that's how you get gra microgravity. If you were to stop, I mean, we're only like 200 miles above the Earth. So if you were to stop, you'd fall like a rock, because at 200 miles from the Earth, it's still 1G, it's pr still pretty much 1G. Yeah. It may be a little bit less than 1G, but you fall like a rock. So what we're doing is falling around the Earth. And when you're free falling like that, it's zero gravity, but it's 
microgravity, which I always find is interesting too, because even at 200 miles uh, altitude, there's still some little bits of atomic oxygen and other things up there. And when that hits your spacecraft, it slows you down. It decelerates you, so you're, you're not going, you, you're, you have a little bit of deceleration. That's why it's called microgravity instead of just zero gravity. I've heard that there are quite a few interesting foods in space. So what is the best food in space after it has been rehydrated? Well, I'll have to answer that. I, I, I always say, first of all, my last flight was 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope they made some improvements. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <Hope so. laughs> but we had like three different types of food. Okay. Rehydratable food, uh -huh. which I didn't find very good. I, I, maybe the taste was probably maybe the best, I suppose, but it's, you just add water, right? And it's, it's mushy. Yeah. So the texture is gone. And uh, I'm also a picky eater, I have to say. Um, I'm a little bit better in my older age, but still picky. <laughs> um, we also had MREs, you know what those are? Mm, no. Uh, meals ready to eat. Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. if you wanted to be not very politically correct, you could say some other things. But a lot of people <laughs> would say like meals rejected by everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but to be honest, if you've ever had an MRE, they're actually pretty good. Hmm. And it was my favorite one, actually, is uh, turkey and gravy. Okay, yeah. Um, and then we also had, like, I think thermostabilized food, which you can go to any outdoor store and buy for your camping trips, you know? Yeah. That will sit. Free stripe food. Yeah, and, and are they th somehow thermally stabilized it? I don't know what they do. Yeah. Like, you know, they have, they had turkey. That stuff was pretty good, too. You know, just sit on the shelf, doesn't need to be refrigerated. So in general, I thought the MREs were pretty good. But not the mush. The mush was bad. I didn't like that. Yeah. So I've also heard about the sleeping conditions in space and those like zero G, like little bags you sleep in kind of thing. So how would you rate that experience? No, sleeping is, I, I, I'm guessing, well maybe not guessing, there's about 50% of the People that are flying space will say it's easy to sleep, and others will say it's hard. I'm one of the people that says it's hard. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, and you're in zero gravity, the only thing that you change is you close your eyes. Yeah. And so that makes it really difficult, mm -hmm. amongst other other things. But I think sleeping um, is very difficult because of that. Mm. And so it's kind of like, like there's no mattress to sleep on. Basically, you're Correct. just kind of like. You just yeah. float. Oh gosh. Yeah, it's not very pleasant. I mean, the bags, I, I guess I used the bag. You could do whatever you wanted, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you know, just to kind of simulate some pressure or like a mattress or whatever, mm -hmm. I would, on, this, on one of the sidewalls, we had like a cargo net. Mm -hmm. And we stuffed like all the stuff that we didn't need, like our chairs that folded up on the mid deck, uh, our parachutes, our helmets. Anything that we didn't need while we were on orbit, we kind of stuffed behind this cargo net. Mm -hmm. And I liked getting, kind of jamming myself in there because you could be, it would put pressure uh -huh. on your front and your back and yeah. make it feel yeah. kind of like you're laying down. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Now, um, does the sun, doesn't the sun rise every 40 minutes or 50 minutes Yeah, so or you're something? going five miles a second, right? You go yeah. around the earth every 90 minutes. And um, so that means every 45 minutes you get a sunrise or a sunset, which is very, very cool. And they're very beautiful, too. Tough for sleeping? <laughs> you know, not really. I, I don't even recall having issues with that. I mean, we had, there were two um, holes, I guess, that you could go from the mid deck to the flight deck. Mm -hmm. um, and we had covers that you could put up there if you wanted to keep the light out. Okay. But I don't think that we ever really used them. And no, most people, I never really remember anybody complaining about it. <laughs> Was math and science relatively easy for you, or did you have to put in the extra effort? Um, math was relatively easy for me. I really liked math. Sometimes I don't know why I didn't get a degree in math. Mm. But you know, being an engineer, you kind of, it is, it's all math. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, I actually tried to get a minor in math and didn't. I did a lot of things too. I, I again, like kind of with that theme of having a backup plan all the time. I did pre med for like a semester mm -hmm. <laughs> or maybe a full year, and then I decided. So I, I ended up taking four and a half years to get my degree because I kind of did took those extra classes trying to cover my bases because I thought being a doctor would be kind of fun too. Yeah. Interesting, very similar. Because I wasn't sure, you know, the whole pilot thing, you had to have good health and good eyesight. Oh yeah. And so I wanted a backup plan in case I wasn't able to pass the physical or whatever. Because I wasn't sure, I wasn't sure if I wanted to sit in the back, for example. <laughs> right. uh, and be a naval flight officer, as they call them, mm -hmm. instead of the pilot. I actually did an ROTC, you know, on each summer you have to go on a summer cruise, they call it. And I, in between, uh, for my first class midshipman, which is your last one you're, when you're a senior, or right before you obtain a senior in college, mm -hmm. I uh, volunteered to go on a submarine. Because oh, okay. I wanted to see how that was like in case I couldn't fly I thought maybe going on a submarine might be better than sitting in the back seat of the airplane yeah. <laughs> and I really enjoyed being on the submarine that was a lot that was very cool actually and that was kind of a special time I was on the USS Finback which was a an attack submarine oh, you know okay. they had two t types of attack and uh, ICBMs um, and the ICBM ones didn't sound very appealing to me. They just go underwater for three months and never surface oh, <laughs> for three months. But attack submarines, they kind of do their own thing, and they're more like an airplane. But in it, it was a lot of fun, actually, extremely interesting. We got qualified as a, a diving officer, which took us eight weeks to do. And so you were the one that controlled the depth of the submarine, which was a lot of fun. And we gave, we got on it. There was about four of us midshipmen. There, we got on it when it just got out of an overhaul, mm -hmm. and so we got we were going with it when it was doing all sorts of trials and tests and stuff. And we actually one time we, we they call it shake rail and rolls, which is extremely interesting too. It's so fluid like an airplane almost, because mm -hmm. we tied everything down on the ship, and then they would push the yoke full forward mm -hmm. and full left. So we were like going down like this in the water, and the depth gauge is going, boo, 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 boo. <laughs> and then we to pull back and all the way over the other direction, and then start coming up, and then and you don't over. get motion sickness, no yeah. motion, and then just push That's over amazing. to the top to make sure we didn't go shooting out of the water. Oh my gosh, that was just an amazing. I thought I, a truly amazing experience too. And then we were on the surface a lot. And we were, you know cruising on the east coast uh, on the surface with all the water coming over the top of the bow and by the whole submarine except for the tower sticking above the water. It's and how long cool. did you do the submarine for before you finished it? Well, we were on for eight weeks, but we weren't, I mean, we never, I think the most we were at sea was probably like five or days or maybe a week. Mm, okay. So you we, were at a port? We, yeah. Uh, actually, that it was fun. It was kind of, we, you know, submarines, they, we were doing this thing in the Bahamas where we were running by these microphones in the water and they were getting our sound signature. And then we would do it, we would turn around and like shut some equipment off and turn other equipment on and then we'd go back to and they'd get your sound signature with all of that equipment running and we're just doing it again. Mm -hmm. And so um, they just did that during the day and when we were in St. Croix, the Virgin Islands, and so they, and they only needed half the crew, so they would leave one half the crew on the beach at, in the Virgin Islands <laughs> for the day, and the other crew would go out and do their thing, and they'd come back, and then we'd switch. And we did that for a couple of weeks. So if someone was watching this, and they were curious about whether or not they should become an astronaut, what would you tell them? I would say yes. But I would also say that it's uh, pretty low odds. Yeah. I always hate that. I don't want to discourage anybody from doing it. Mm -hmm. That's what I always say. But 
I mean, just an example, I think the last selection that we had, we had like 16 or 17,000 applications for like 10 slots. Wow. So the odds are very low. <laughs> so that's why I start talking about a lot of luck. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I just, because I, because I'm a Navy test pilot. I mean, even Navy test pilots, if you know any Navy pilots, they're all the same. And especially test pilots, they're even more the same. <laughs> they kind of have all the same background, the same attitudes, and uh, and same, almost the same things. And I don't know how NASA can tell the difference, um, and how they make a choice, you know, between all those people. Yeah. But they end up doing it somehow, and they, uh, like I said, I think it's a lot of luck. It just reminded me that we have in the in the astronaut office we had a band and it was called Max Q, nice. which is which is Max Q is a maximum aerodynamic pressure, mm. and so the band's name was Max Q. But they happen to be playing in Galveston tomorrow night mm. at the Opera House, really, which is kind of cool too. I started playing saxophone in um, uh, third grade, I guess. Mm. I was, that's when we were in Chicago. I, I don't know what happened to Chicago, but she, and when I was in Chicago, they had this great music program. I'm, I'm still amazed at it when I think back about it. You know, I, here we are in third grade, mm -hmm. and they brought in the Chicago Philharmonic Orchestra. Wow. It is elementary school. Wow. They did it to all the, all the schools. And they came in, you know, like for an hour program, and they, each instrument was demonstrated to us, you know. Oh. And I remember being impressed by the French horn. Mm. <laughs> Beautiful. I wanted to play the French horn. And when, so when we got around to picking instruments, the guy, the first thing he told me to do was go, <laughs> you know, like that? Yeah. Because so you, you need to do that to play yeah, a, do, yeah. a, like a trumpet or whatever, mm -hmm. yeah. a brass instrument. And I couldn't do it very well, like I still can't, I guess. And he said, why don't you, maybe you should play a reed instrument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so I looked at the clarinet, and I didn't like that thing. So I thought the sax saxophone was pretty good, so I ended up playing saxophone. But I haven't really, I mean, I played all the way through, you know, from third grade to uh, senior in high school. Did the marching band the first year in high school. And then, um, and then we had, like, this big jazz band thing that we did in the evenings. And so I enjoyed that. But then after I went to college, I didn't do anything after that. And that was how I got to meet retired astronaut Captain Mike Baker. Interviewing Captain Mike Baker was a really interesting and enlightening experience. For all of you that are interested in becoming an astronaut or were just curious about being an astronaut, I hope you guys learned something new. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially until this point. That was a long video, especially for me. While you guys are here, make sure to like, subscribe, and click that notification bell. I mean, it's free. Why wouldn't you do it? Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye bye